the FBI is a great, uh, she's a great person to be in here talking about identity theft because they deal with this firsthand so many times. She is um, in the Cincinnati office, has been there about 10 years, and she does a lot of these presentations, so I'm really excited about, and I have to preview her PowerPoint. So there's a lot of content to cover. I will warn everybody. Um, if we don't get through it all, like I said, it'll be available um, for you guys to download. So with that said, I'm going to let you take over, Pam. Thank, Thank you. you. Can everybody hear me? Ah, oh, great. The microphone is working. We're here today to talk about identity theft. Identity theft is near and dear in my heart because when I went into private practice, one of the first things I did was work for something called the Volunteer Lawyer Project. And there were people that had their identities stolen and I would represent them. Um, one of the people that I know that they had this happen to them, well, she thought they had, it had happened to her. And she turned out to just have an early stage of Alzheimer's. And she just forgot about a lot of the purchases she made and a lot of things she did. So sometimes when you think something's identity theft, it's not. So what I'm going to talk to you today is about what it is and what you can do, what steps you can take to prevent it, because you can prevent some of it, but you can't prevent all of it. And those that you can't prevent, I'm going to show you how you can find out if your identity has been stolen, and then what to do if your identity is stolen. If you have any questions as we go through this, just raise your hand. Uh, if something's on your mind, it's probably on somebody else's mind, too. So identity theft, there's a thing called identity theft, and there's identity fraud. Identity fraud is where somebody makes up an identity, creates a social security number, creates a, a fictitious persona, and goes out and commits crimes. While that doesn't cost you directly, it does cost you indirectly because if they steal things, prices are going to go up and you're going to pay for them. Identity theft, on the other hand, is where somebody steals your, takes your identity, takes your social security number, and creates, you know, get, you start using your credit. It's detrimental to your credit account. It is detrimental to insurance sometimes because they go off of what your credit score is. And it can be a mess to clean up. But we're going to talk about how to clean it up. But first of all, you've got to know how it happened. So what are the different ways that you can see that it happened? Somebody could use a credit card. They could steal your credit card number and start using it and create transactions on it. You're not going to know about it until you go and you look at your credit card statement and you go through it. Now, my son was terrible. He would go through and say, ah, oh, there's a 99 cents charge. That's nothing. It's like, oh my gosh, stop. That is one of the warning signs because they will get these little charges and see if they go through before they start using larger purchases. So if a 99 cents charge goes through, they will start charging your credit card to the limit. So you want to look because you want to make sure that there aren't those charges on there. Like that, you also have to know when your billing cycle is. Because if you don't know when your billing cycle is, you won't know if you're missing a credit card statement. One of the first things identity thieves do is to change your address. So when the credit card statement comes to you, it doesn't go to you, it goes to a different address. So make a notation of when your billing address or your billing statement comes. And if it doesn't come, Okay, I might give them an extra week because my husband works for the post office and they're kind of slow sometimes. It happens. Things get slowed down in the mail. Some companies might send things out a little bit later. But after a week, I'm on the phone and I call the 1-800 number that's on the back of my credit card saying, okay, I haven't received a statement this month. What do you have as my address? You call them. So it's okay for you to give them your credit card number. If somebody calls you and says, this is the IRS. You have bills you haven't paid and you were supposed to pay you know, this much amount because it's due to the IRS. No, the IRS isn't going to call you. Most places are not going to call you. They're going to send you letters. If you call the place and you know you're calling the correct number, then you can give them the information and feel comfortable about it. But if they called you, I would not give them a thing. One of the scams that, I don't know if Mary's going to talk about it today or not, is when people call and say, you know, your, your niece is in jail, blah, 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 and they're trying to pull information out of you so you can think this is all legitimate and trying to get information so they can get money from you. And what I do if I ever get a call like that, and I did get one once, I said, oh, my gosh, my niece, 
Amelia? And they're like, yes, it's Amelia. And it's like, I don't have a niece named Amelia. Click. You know? Make something up. Just like, you know, we're going to talk about when you get phishing emails. A lot of times you'll get phishing emails and they'll send you somewhere else. I make up things on there, too. You know, they say, this place needs your information. Put in your password. I'll put in a fake password. I'll put in a password I know I have never used in my life. Like, I'll put down the username, and then I'll put down Pickle for my password. I never use Pickle. If it goes through, you know it's not right, because it wouldn't have gone through. So get out of there. And I deviate. I'm sorry. So the other ways, they can take over an existing account, which means they are going to change your address. They are going to change everything. They are going to take over this account and start using it. The easiest way to find that out is checking your credit report. And we're going to talk about how to do that three times a year for free. It's not going to cost you a dime. Or they can create a new account. And you might think it's a little hard for people to create accounts. But have you ever received those approved, pre-approved notices in the mail? You know, you've been approved for a credit card. Somebody I know in Columbus got one of those and went, <laughs> ripped it up in seven pieces, threw it in the trash, and went, I wonder. Picked it back out, taped it back together, changed his address, sent it in, and he got a credit card. He changed his address to his business address because he was wondering if it would come, and it did. So we're going to talk about using a shredder because if you use a shredder, they're not going to be able to put it back together, eh, depending on what kind of shredder you have. But we're going to talk about using those. And that's one of the good things that you should do is use a shredder. So how do you know that your identity has been stolen? There are warning signs out there. You could get a call from a financial institution that says, this seems completely out of the ordinary, or we got a charge from California. Are you in California? You know, with people having mobile phones, it's really easy for the phone call go, to go to California. You go, ah, that's not me. I have never been out there. I've seen things on my credit card statements that are from Wisconsin. It's like, I haven't been to Wisconsin in 10 years. That's not me. You know, and they, they're going to call you if they see something out of the ordinary. One of the big things is, is there's something out of the country. Let's say there's a charge from Italy. They're going to call you and say, there's this charge that just showed up in Italy. A lot of times, if it's outside the country, they just will not approve it. It won't go through. So on the flip side, if you travel somewhere out of the country, call your credit card company if you are planning on using that card because you may get over to Italy, may want to charge something, and it might be declined, and you go, going, what in the world? I know I have plenty of credit. Why is it declined? Call them. Let them know because they are very aware of all this identity theft. And they are trying to make it so it doesn't happen. Or you don't get charged for it at least. Which is why it's so very important for you to go through your credit card, your checking account, and making sure there's no charges on there that do not belong to you. And if you see something, pull out your credit card. Look on the back. There's a 1-800 number. Call them. They have a fraud department. They will work with you. Tell them you did not authorize this charge. This is not yours. You want to dispute it. They will work with you. And if they find out that there's a good chance your identity was stolen, they will give you a new credit card number. And they will send you the credit card. Yeah, generally, they send it FedEx. And you'll have to activate it once you get it. But they will get rid of that card. It costs them about $25 to issue a new card. But they won't charge you because they want to keep your business. Okay, so you may see an account that you didn't open on your credit report. The only way you're going to know this is if you look at your credit report because nobody is going to tell you that you have a new account because they are not going to give them your address. They're going to give them a fictitious address. So you've got to start looking at your credit report to see if there's any new account that's been opened. You may get a call from a collection agency asking you why you didn't pay a bill. Now, I know my first response would be like, you're crazy. I've paid all my bills and hang up on them. That is like the exact wrong thing to do. Stop. Find out who they are. Who are the, usually at a collection agency, there's some other company that the bill is through. Like, let's, let's say it's through Sears. Sears may hire an agency to collect their bills. So they may say they're ABC collection company. And you can ask them, who is the bill for? What is the amount? So you can go back to Sears and call them and get it straightened out. 
if it's a large department store, they're going to have a fraud department and they're going to work with you to get it straightened out. I don't know if you in the back can see, this just says, we're looking for someone who can tell, help us crack down on identity theft. Fill out this application and don't forget to include your social security number, date of birth, phone number, home address, and mother's maiden name. People get social security numbers, they steal all sorts of things. So you would be amazed of where, if you're giving out this information, how people can get it and use it. Could be putting in for a job. You know, a lot of times you're not going to have to put in that information until you're hired. Could be the doctor's office. The doctor's office used to use your social security number to file everything. They don't anymore. And if I go to the doctor's office and he has social security number, I just ignore that block. I've never been questioned on it at all. So how can it be stolen? You can lose your wallet. You can lose your purse. You can lose a credit card. Nowadays, you can have a chip that's installed in one of your credit cards, and people can use a radio frequency identifying skimmer to get that information off, or they can walk by you and just skim the information off of you. Now, there's a couple different simple ways that you can protect yourself. They make little cards now that you can put your credit cards in where they can't get that information. They make purses that do the same thing. If you don't want to spend the money, you can wrap it in tinfoil. If it's wrapped in tinfoil, they're not going to be able to get that information. So just wrap it in tinfoil. Not every card is, has that radio frequency identifier where you know you can just walk by and skim something. You, know, you can do it at McDonald's. There are places you can just barely skim your card and it gets your information. It will get uh, the account number, the expiration date, and your name. It will not give them the three-digit security code on the back. It will not give them certain information. But there are ways that you can protect yourself so you're not worried about somebody skimming your information as you're just walking by. Mail theft. People can steal your mail. Just to show of hands, how many people have a rural mailbox that they can put a flag up to let the mail carrier know that they have mail? I've got one. Okay. How many people use that to mail their bill bills? You don't have to put up your hand if you don't. When you put up that flag to let somebody know you got mail that's go outgoing, fantastic for the letter carrier, they can drive by, pick up the mail, take it to the post office, but you're also letting identity thieves know that you've got outgoing mail. And I'll bet you nine times out of ten, there's either a check-in there or there's a credit card statement that you're paying. There's some kind of bill in there that people can use that to steal your identity if you don't want them to do that. So take your mail. You know, if you feel like you're secure at work, I work for the FBI, I feel secure at work. I can mail my mail at the FBI. I feel okay. But otherwise, there's those big blue boxes. Put it in one of the big blue boxes. Give it to the letter carrier. If the post office has had some instances of identity theft, but it's relatively minor. It doesn't happen much. So, I mean, it's a more safe place than putting in your mailbox. Oh, and the check. They can tape over your name. And they can use certain solutions. There's certain pens that can't be wiped off. But those pens, they can wipe off with different solutions. They can make that check payable for them to any amount. Take that tape off of your signature and go to the bank and cash it. So my suggestion, use the big blue box. Mail it safely. You don't use your rural mailbox. Very convenient, but it's also very convenient for the identity thieves. Skimming information, we kind of talked about that with the radio frequency skimmers. We're going to show you what a skimmer looks like because you can see it on ATMs. You can see it on gas pumps. There's different places where you may notice a skimmer. Dumpster diving. Before I had this job, I didn't think people went through people's trash to get information. <laughs> yeah, they do. So be very careful. On the flip side of that, some people are very diligent to recycle things, and they recycle their bills. So some people may, instead of going dumpster diving, they may go to a recycling facility and see if they can find some information to steal someone's identity. Don't give it to them. Shred that information. Shoulder surfing. Somebody could be standing over your shoulder and watching you, especially if, if your information's been skimmed. They may be watching you to put in your password. They may be listening to you. 
you go to an airport and you go, oh, I forgot to rent a car. So you call up Avis and say, I need to rent a car when I get to Boston. And they say, fine, we need a credit card to hold it. And you pull it out. You are on your, your phone, your mobile phone, and you don't think about the people around you. And you tell them your, your account number. You tell them the security code on the back. There might be somebody behind you writing all that information down. Be aware of where you're at when you give out information. You don't want to give them your identity. Make it as difficult as possible. People can eavesdrop. That would be like at the airport, somebody sitting in the back of you writing everything down. Impersonation. Um, I'm terrible at names. The gentleman that was up here before me talked about how somebody called in and said that they were so-and-so because he needed verbal confirmation. They were impersonating someone to say that they were somebody else so they could steal their identity. It happens. You might get a scam phone call. I think Mary's going to talk about scam phone calls a little bit. Um, your computer can be hacked. You can be very safe doing things online as long as you're careful. If you have all of your firewalls updated, if you have, if you don't know what I'm talking about, don't do online banking, don't do this kind of stuff. Don't go to the library and do it because that's a very computer that everybody, the general public has access to. So be careful with that. We're gonna, I'm going to show you what phishing looks like. Update your spyware and social networking. We're going to talk about that just a little bit because they can get information from you through social networking sites like Facebook. There's a lot of stuff out there that you got to watch your security settings and where this information is going to. And you got to watch what you post. Okay, so scam and junk emails. They may mimic, I can't talk, mimic financial institutions. They may look like, we've had some that came out that look like they're from the FBI. We got all sorts of calls. You know, I received this email from you. It was a phishing email. I'm going to show you what they look like. They want you to click to something and then give you your information. So they could use that information to create credit accounts, to create credit cards, to really destroy your credit. Okay, so here's one that looks like it's from Amazon.com. But it's not from Amazon.com. And they show you a little link and it says click here and update your information. They want your information. This is where, if I think for some reason that I think it's real, <laughs> okay, if I think it's real for some reason and I click to it, I'm going to put a fake password in. Like I said, I'll put in pickles. And if it works, I know it's a bad, bad, bad scam site, and I'll just click out of it. If you think it's, it might be real, it's from, like, say, your bank, call them. Say, I just received this. Is this legitimate? I'll pretty much guarantee you they're going to tell you no. They may have to forward it on to them with a certain header information. They'll probably talk you through how to do it, so they may be able to find out where this information came from, who's doing this. But you're not going to get that. You're not going to get it from the FBI. You're not going to get it from the IRS. Just be very careful with scamming. The first phishing attack didn't happen until 2002, so it's only been 13 years, and it works. It catches between 5 and 20 percent of all users. So if you're one of those small percentage, it's worth it. It's going to keep going until this stuff does not work anymore. A lot of it will go into your spam email, so you won't even look at it. And it still catches between 5 and 20 percent. So that's of people that actually get them. It filters 63 percent of phishing emails. Most of your mail server spam folders will, will pull it out. And think about that. They pull out 63% and they're still catching between 5 and 20%. That's a lot. If you think it's real, use a fake password. Because if it works, then you know it's not real. Okay, so if you did respond to one accidentally, what do you do? Call your bank. Close the account. Change your account number. Social networking sites. Be careful what information you put out there. It's a great way to connect with friends, to let people know what's going on. I love it. I see, you know, my nieces and my nephews being born. Lovely pictures. It keeps me going about what's going on with the family. I love it. But be careful what you post. And if you post pictures, a lot of times there are going to be biomarkers on there that's going to let other people know exactly where you're at and where that picture was taken. 
You know what's the worst? Is when you tell people on Facebook, um, leave on vacation in three weeks. Okay, you told all your friends, and then if your friends post, they will, their friends will know. It just gets around, and you let a lot of people know that your house is going to be empty. So don't do it. Don't. I might do something when I get back from vacation. Just got back from a week in Italy. Here's these lovely pictures. Okay, I did it after I got back. You know, it's not like anybody can come and steal things from my house because it was vacant. So be careful what you post. You really have to watch pictures that go up. People are going to be able to pull information. Just be very careful with these social networking sites because you want to limit it, the information that you put out there. So what can you do to socialize safely? Think about the sites that you're at and before you decide to join one. Okay, some people say you should go ahead and join one because let's say somebody wants to steal my identity. They may create a web page, a Facebook page that says it's me to try to get information from my friends and family. Well, and then they'll put out invitations because it's me. So I know somebody who suggests opening one up, opening up a Facebook account in your name, and then just, if you don't want to use it, never use it again. But somebody can't take your identity because you've already created that account. They can't have two people with the same name. Now, they may modify it a little bit, but it's going to be a little different. Keep control over the information that you're sending out. Keep vital information to yourself. I know a lot, a lot of people on Facebook love to have their birthdays out there because they love getting all these birthday wishes. Okay, I know a friend of mine who does it five days before her birthday. And so I know when her birthday is, and I always send her something that says, Happy Facebook birthday. You know, I know that's not really her birthday, but that's okay. You, you might want to change the year, change the date, change some of the vital information so people don't know this about you. Don't let your screen name say too much about you. Um, a lot of people use emails and they'll just use your last name, dot your first name. Well, that's telling everybody who it is. Uh, my husband used to do one with his birth year. It's like, don't put your birth year in it. You know, if you want to put your age, put your age, because it'll change. It's not going to be the same. And it might be bad the first year, but after that, it's not going to be so bad. So he does. His is like, I don't know. Mike Roller 29, I don't know where he gets the 29 from, but that's, that's what he does. It's like, okay, it doesn't mean anything, so it's a good one to have. Skimmers, these are amazing. Have you ever seen a skimmer before? It is that small, it fits in the palm of your hand. Somebody can just have it in their dress pocket if they have a jacket on. Somebody could walk by, if this say, I hate saying this because we're at a restaurant. But let's say somebody picks up your clothes. Oh, I know what I'll do. I'll do a clothing store. Let's say you go to a clothing store and you decide to make a purchase. Okay, so you pick out a sweater and you go to the front and you pay for it with your credit card. And they grab your credit card and they turn around for a second and they turn back around and you don't think anything of it. They might have turned around, skimmed it inside their breast coat pocket, turned around and did, you know, worked it on the machine and now they have your credit card number. They have all the information that's on there because they skimmed it. They put them on ATM machines. It's like really bad, in gas pumps. So I'm going to show you three pictures, and I want you to see if you can see anything different about them. This is picture number A. There's B. And there's C. Anybody catch anything look kind of funny? You want me to go back? Okay, that's C. There's B. There's A. Somebody said B. What do you see on B? Okay. Here's B. There's a skimming device right over the card reader. You want me to go back to the card reader, what it looks like without it? And there it is with it. And this one, what makes it even worse, is they have, oh, I don't have it on there. 
they had a little machine that he had a pamphlet holder, which he had a camera, which was transmitting the information when you keyed in your password, your PIN number, so they could read your PIN number. Here's another one. Here's a gentleman just walking, looks like he's just using an ATM machine. And this is inside a bank lobby. I want you to pay attention to that. Look at the date and time. It's been a few years, but it was on a Friday at 634. So you know the bank's closed for the weekends. But what he was really doing is he was putting in a trap to capture the next person's card. And he sits there and he waits. And he has a lookout that's in the parking lot because he doesn't want to get caught. So the next person comes in, puts in his card, puts in his PIN number and begins his transaction. But nothing works. It confiscates his card. It won't give him cash. It won't give him his card back. And he's thinking, now what do I do? Ah, oh, here comes somebody to help him out. And he says, you know, I heard if you press Control-Alt-Delete at the same time as you put in your PIN number, it'll pop that card right back out. So the guy thinks, well, I want to get my card back. He tries it again and again and again. The first guy, he's watching him put in his PIN number. Nothing's happening. So the guy finally gives up and he leaves. Okay, so now here's the first guy. He knows the PIN number, and he has the ATM card. It's kind of trapped in the machine. So he pulls it back out. I'm going to show you what it looks like. That's it. It's that small. It's a piece of x-ray material, and it looks like it's part of the ATM machine. When they put it in, it just goes in there. They flip it up. It holds the card so it never goes all the way in. The guy has the card. The guy has the PIN number. He can take out whatever amount he's authorized to take out on that card. See, that's when it's put in there. You can't see it. It blends in. And that's him pulling, opening it back up and pulling out the card. So what do you do if something like this happens to you? Number one, notify the bank. Number two, if somebody comes by to help you out, don't put in your PIN number because somebody's watching over your shoulder. Just don't do it. Has anybody ever heard the thing that said, if you put in your PIN number backwards, it notifies the police? Has anybody heard that? Yeah, it's a, it's a hoax. My sister told me that, and I just looked at it. I said, what about ones that are like 5005, that are the same forward and backwards? And she's like, I don't know. I, I don't think you're allowed to do that. <laughs> I love my sister, but it's like sometimes it just makes me shake my head. Okay, so what to do? Shield your PIN number from anybody that's watching. If somebody's there and they're insistent on watching you, go use another machine. Say, nah, I don't need the money and just walk off. Don't take advice from helpful strangers. If somebody says, oh, I know how to get this back. Don't do it. Pull it out. And contact the bank. Use the same ATM machine over and over so you can see if there's something different. That's probably one of the biggest clues if there's a skimmer on there. You can shake it a little bit. If it just comes loose, there's a skimmer on there. If there's something different than the one before, you know, when you've gone to it before and then you notice something, call the bank. See if they put a new machine in there, if there's a skimmer on there. Be careful. And if you're in a different town, and you need to use an ATM, I would go to a bank first, a bank lobby. That's probably the safest of all, but it does happen in bank lobbies. I'd still probably be jiggling it, making sure nothing's on there. Another thing is there's little arrows that go up to the card reader, and that, that arrows, it shouldn't be like overlap. There should be a little bit of space. That's a clue that there's a skimmer on there. If there's no space, if it overlaps, something's on there. So just be careful with it. So does this one look ordinary? Anything look odd to anybody? Looks like a pretty ordinary ATM to me. But somebody inserted a skimmer, and they just made it go right over the regular skimmer. So it doesn't look like anything's amiss. And the only way you would know is if you use the same over and over again. Ah, uh, this is the pamphlet holder. 
They have the pamphlet holder, and inside of it is a camera. Here's the inside of the pamphlet holder. So you can see the camera. And if you go back, they have it pointed so it can see that you're putting in the PIN number and if you're putting in the correct PIN number. It is transmitting it wirelessly so you can be 650 feet away and still be getting the information. So financial institutions are doing a lot to keep identity theft from help happening. They're developing new software. That's why they put out the chip cards, the, the, some of them are with the radio frequency. So they're evolving. They know there's problems with identity theft, and they're trying to do everything they can to make it so it is more and more difficult for people to steal your identity. They're educating consumers. They're letting you know that this is a possibility and what to watch out for. They're providing assistance to identity theft victims, and they're cooperating with the local police and the federal police to try to break up some of these rings. Law enforcement's working with the business. They're working with people. They're shutting down websites, but you would be amazed how quickly they come right back up. They're training more officers at all levels. In, in Hamilton County, you guys have one great thing. You have something called an identity theft passport. So if you get your identity theft stolen, and you've got a police report that shows you that your identity theft stolen, you can contact Hamilton County Police Department, the Sheriff's Office, they will send somebody out that is just, that's what they do, is work with people with, that have had their identity stolen. They will take your picture, so you get a little passport. And so, if let's say you're driving down the highway, and you see the red lights behind you, and you're like, oh no, what now? And somebody pulls you over and says, we have a warrant out for your arrest, and you say, oh no, it's not me, I've had my identity stolen. Well, you'll have that little passport to help prove it. You may have still have to go to the county jail. You may still be stuck there for a few hours, but you'll eventually be out, and that little passport will really help you get out a lot quicker. Hamilton County is wonderful. In fact, I think they started the program in Ohio. Yes? Yeah. The black, that, that was one of the information that they did to try and make it harder to steal your information. Now they have the chips, but some of the chips are the radio frequency chips. So they're the ones you have to watch out if somebody comes by with one of the handheld skimmers and they can just go right by your purse, just walk by you. You don't even know what's happening because they're radio frequency. While it helps some things, it makes things worse. Not every card is radio frequency though. And the, Institutions are aware of this, so they're doing things to try to help it, to change the cards, to make it better. So what can you do to protect yourself? Check your credit report, and I say at least once a year, but you really should do it a lot more than that. You can do it three times a year for free. I think, if you put in the handouts, the handouts I gave you, is that in their bags? Yes. Okay. You can go through there and it'll talk about a website, www.annualcreditreports.com, where you can request your free credit report. Do it at a computer that you feel safe and secure at. Don't do it at one that anybody can have access to. You are going to be asked for your social security number, but it's one where you have gone there. So you're, you're going to feel safe giving the information because you have gone to this site. You can do it three times a year because there's three credit reporting companies, three major credit reporting companies. There's Equifax, there's TransUnion, and there's Experian. So January 1st, you decide you're going to do TransUnion. And in April, I guess it would be May because it would be four months later, you would do Equifax. And then six months later, you do Experian. So each credit report is going to look a little bit different but it's going to give you all the information you need. How else are you going to know that somebody opened a credit card in your name if you don't get your credit report? And that's why it's so important for you to get your credit report, because otherwise you will not know what's happened. It's, the little booklets that you get is going to have this annualcreditreport.com site. It's going to give you the 1-800 number. It's going to give you the mailing address. So when you pick up your packet, that information's in there. 
monitor your online accounts safely. I know some people that do it every single morning to make sure nobody's used anything. If you want to do that, that's fine, as long as you're doing it from a secure computer. You know, don't go to a library and do it because you're going to give everybody all your information. You don't want to do it. If you're in a secure workplace, you feel like you can do it, that's fine. Review your statements to make sure there's nothing on there. There's no dollar charges. There's no 99 cents charges. You see something that doesn't belong to you? Call the 1-800 number on the back of your card. Quickly call any financial institution if you find out that there's something there that isn't yours. Dispute it. Let them know. Like I said, if they believe it's identity theft, they will give you a new card number. No problem. Okay, here's another one. How many people here choose not to sign their credit cards when they get them in the mail? Okay, I didn't used to do it. Okay, or put down C identification. Okay, the problem with that is, is you've just voided the contract. So you can be liable for every single purchase. If you went and you made one purchase and you did not sign your card and then you lost it and somebody stole your identity and there's all of these charges on there now, you can be liable for every single one of them. So sign your card because that's your only way that they could check to make sure that it really is you. I know a lot of times you don't look at it, but sign your card. How can they know that you didn't sign it? If it's stolen and somebody else uses it and they catch the person that used it and they find out that they find the credit card and it's unsigned, then they'll know. So you know, be careful with that. You can sign your name and put next to it C identification or CID. You know, if you write small enough, you can put both on there. And that's fine. But sign your card. That's okay. One of the other things I want to mention when I talked about call your financial institution, one of the best things you can do when you get a credit card is make a copy front and back of your credit card number, of your credit card information. Because then if your stuff is, if your purse is stolen, if your wallet is stolen, you can pull that out and you'll have all the 1-800 numbers. You'll have your credit card number. Just remember to update it when you get new cards. Don't leave a lot of information lying around. There are going to be prying eyes. You know, I feel safe in my house because I have it just in one in the desk and nobody goes into my kitchen and that's where my shredder is. But when I was raising my kids, I never knew who was going to be in my house and I was very careful with it. So watch what information you keep lying around. Don't keep information you don't need in your wallet. You like your social security card? Don't keep it in there. What, if you start a new job, you may need it. How many times in your lifetime have you started a new job? You really need to carry that around. You're just giving somebody your social security number. Don't carry it around. Don't leave receipts at the gas station. Nowadays, it's just XXXX out because it doesn't have the number. But it used to have part of your, your uh, credit card number on there. So get rid of it. So don't carry it with you. Don't. doctor's office for the very first time that you've never been there before, you're going to have to take your Medicare card. If you are so concerned that something's going to happen to you, take your Medicare card, make a copy of it, black it out your social security number, and carry, and then copy it again so nobody can read through it and say something bleeds through, and carry that. There's, there's, most doctor's offices or hospitals will accept that knowing that you will get them that information down the road. If you feel like you really have to carry something around, carry that. It's not going to have your social security number on it. But the first time, take it with you because they're going to need it. Shred your information, your personal information. There's three different kinds of shredders. There is a straight shredder and it takes about an hour to put a straight shredder, a piece of paper back together again. But it can be done. There's a cross cut shredder which looks like little diamonds when you shred things. Okay, it takes about 
eight hours to put that back together. And there's a pulverizer, which takes things into fine grains of, of sand. We use that at the FBI. They cannot put the stuff back together. There is no way. But it's also a very expensive shredder. Most people don't want to use that. They will use a cross-cut shredder. They, they're relatively inexpensive anymore. If you feel that you need more than that, take it and put it between garbage cans. I know some lady, and she lives in Ohio, she makes her own logs for the fireplace. She takes her shredded material, she stuffs it in there, and then she burns it. So not only is it shredded, it's burnt. Yes. Okay, that's wonderful. And it's good that you use those services. So what you can do is protect your mail, make sure you send and receive it safely, use those big blue boxes. Remember your bank and your credit card companies, they already have your information. They're not gonna call you and say, give me your account number. They know what it is. And if you call them, you may need to get it, but you're the one who initiated the call there. Some places they need your social security number. Let's say you, you're in Dearborn County, Indiana, and you want to create an account to get gas and electric service. Some of the utility companies have gotten ripped off for so long that they require your social security number. Now they may say, if you give us a $500 deposit, we'll take that instead of your social security number. Sometimes they won't. There are some places that need it, but it's very, very few. But remember, banks need it. Um, you new jobs, the IRS needs it. There are places that need your social security number. But be very careful if you give it out. And if you give it out, find out what they're going to do with it. How many people are going to see it? You know, are they insistent you need to put it on a check? Who's going to see that? How, when's it going to get to the bank? Just be careful who you give that information out to. So shredders. There are some obstacles with shredders. And I hate doing this since you just started eating. But be very careful. Turn it off when it's not in use, unplug it. it. It won't turn on by itself unless you have poltergeist in your house or something. You know, it's not gonna happen. Don't let little kids do it. You know, they may love shredding things, just be careful. You know, if they're gonna do it, be very careful with them. Watch animals around shredders, that's why I said unplug it, because they can get their ears caught and if they have an automatic feed, it would just be bad. Same thing with neckties and, and, and necklaces. Be careful when you use a shredder. And when you're not using it, just unplug it. Put it in a place where nobody's going to see it. That way the kids aren't going to say, oh, I want to shred stuff. Don't carry around your social security card. Don't give your number just because somebody asked for it. They need it. Ask why they need it. And remember, financial institutions are going to ask for it. You need to give it to them. If you do not prepare your own tax return, be very careful about giving them their your numbers. Make sure what they're doing with your social security number, what they're doing with all your information. Make sure it's a very reputable form firm that's doing your taxes. It can be used by somebody to get a job, and if they do that, they could use your tax, they could submit a claim to get your, all your taxes back. You might get something from the IRS. If you do, call them up. They have a fraud department. They will work with you to help to get your identity back to where it needs to be. There is the 1-800 number for the IRS, www.irs.gov. Call them, talk to them, they will work with you. And this is from the IRS and it says, just because you're the victim of identity theft doesn't mean you can claim another de identity as your dependent. There are services like LifeLock, and if people choose to use them, that's fine. It depends how diligent you are. If you're very diligent where you're checking everything, you're checking everything. Um, if you don't, if you feel you need an extra service, it's fine if you can afford it. The only thing you have to watch out for is while they will protect, protect your financial security, if somebody commits a crime using your identity, they may not protect that. 
So before you sign up, find out what you're signing up for, what the fees are, who's going to have that information, who works at LifeLock, because you're giving them your social security number, you're giving them all your information. Make sure that they've been bonded, that everything's secure there. I've heard that, but I've also heard the president has had his identity stolen because he advertises it. So he thinks it happened. So just be careful. If you're going to do it, be careful with it. And you can make that choice. If you feel like you need that, that is a personal choice that you can make. Every, the, every place is different. Okay. Some places are, are rolled them out back in May. So there, there, there's no set guideline that things have to be rolled out by a certain date. And there are some problems with the radio frequency. So it may be your company is trying to do something to protect people from that problem. You know, when you're using something online, you just have to know that you're going to the right site. There are a lot of legitimate retailers out there that you can put in. What I would look for is one thing, and there's HTTPS in the website address, which shows it's secure. So when you're transferring that information electronically, it's more secure. And there's also a little lock box, so you'll know it's secure. They have been people that have hacked that, where they have used that, but it's just not become the norm. So I would look for both the lock and the S when I'm using it. I use PayPal all the time. So yes, because I feel comfortable with PayPal. They've been around a long time. They have my number. And if anything happens, they are really good about remedying the issue right there. So they'll do it where you don't have to go through somebody else. So the bank account should not get forwarded to the user and then PayPal can handle that. And PayPal sends them the information and then, yes, I find it safer and that's what I use myself. Any thoughts of the difference between debit cards and credit cards? Yes, there's a lot of difference between them. If you have a debit card, you can be actually charged more if you lose your, your card than you can if it's a credit card. A credit card, they can, there's a limit where you can be $50 is the most they can charge you, and most financial institutions waive that. With debit cards, they can charge you so much more. So if you have a choice between using the two, I would use a credit card. Debit cards are, are nice. My kids love them. I just... I made it to CH. I use everything I look at says use a credit card. Instead of a debit card, you'd be much more secure using a credit card. You have a lot more recourse if something goes wrong. So online, you can do things online safely, and this has kind of gotten back to what you were talking about. Use a firewall. Make sure that your operating system is up to date. Turn off your computer when it's not being used. So you don't have to worry about somebody coming in and hacking in that information. When you're not using it, just turn it off. Know the web address you're going to and make sure you're going just to that address. Read and learn how to use the web, how the website is going to use your information. Make sure they're not giving it out to anybody else. Clean your hard drives. All this is very important. Before you do, let's say you're done with your computer and you're going to donate it to charity. 
take your hard drive out and feed it with a hammer. People aren't going to be able to get to your hard drive. If you use any of your financial information, just take that out. They can get a new hard drive and put it in there. It's still going to be worthwhile to them. But if you if you try to wipe it clean, they can still get some of the information off. I would just take it out and destroy that hard drive. The FBI isn't the only one who deals with identity theft. The Secret Service deals with it. The FTC is a lead government agency. Um, there's a www.antifishing.com site where you can go and get more information about it. This, I think, is very important, and this isn't in the handout. There's something called opt-out. If you get those pre-approved credit card offers, you can call this number, one 5 opt out or go to www.optoutprescreen.com, and you will stop getting those pre-approved credit card offers for five years. Now, it won't work if, let's say, you know, I have a credit card with Kohl's and they have a subsidiary named, I don't know, Joel's. I may get a credit card offer from them because they're a subsidiary from Kohl's. But that's it. Anybody else that is using my credit report to get information, they will not be able to do it because I've done this 1 800, 1 888 5 opt out. It's good for five years. You start getting them in the mail again, you know your five years is up. Time to call them again. So, what do you do to protect your identity? Don't give out your social security number. Check your credit report at least three times a year, and you can do it for free. Guard your mail. Keep track of your billing cycles. Examine your financial statements. Buy a shredder and use it. Know your ATM. Protect your computer. Shop safely. Opt out. Credit freezes, I think, are wonderful. Online banking is great. Credit freezes, they actually freeze your credit so nobody can get the information. You go to apply for a loan, it's only going to be the header information that comes up and nobody's going to give anybody a loan. In Ohio, it's $5 per person per credit agency. It's not bad and it's good forever. Kentucky is $7 to $10, $10 for seven years. Indiana's not bad either, but Ohio, it's, it's a really it's a nice deal. If you think you're done with credit, you're not going to get any more credit, freeze your credit. Places that you can go to find out about things that are going on, www.lookstogoodtobetrue.com. That's the FBI site. It'll tell you about all sorts of different scams that are going on and being perpetuated at the moment. It'll explain them to you. It'll give you examples. It'll tell you what you can do so you're not a victim of these frauds. The ICC Internet Crime Complaint Center, they keep track of Internet fraud to see if there's something going on locally like in one area. So if there is and they see something, then they will contact the local police department so that they're aware of it and they can start investigating it. They're our lead on identity theft. So the FTC is, is wonderful, but the IC3.gov is a good place if you, if you find out that there's problems with identity theft. Okay, well then I'm wrapping it up. So what to do if you think you're a victim of identity theft? Call your financial institution. They have people that are trained to help you with this. They will walk you through it. They'll probably give you a new credit card. When you get it, sign it. They'll investigate the circumstances. They'll make sure if you really are a victim of identity theft. When I started doing identity theft presentations, when I started representing people, one of the people I represented, they, she thought, she really, truly thought she was a victim of identity theft, and she just had dementia. It's very sad, but they're going to investigate it, and they're going to find out. If you are a victim, they will give you a police report. They would probably tell you to create a police report so that you'll send somebody out, they'll be able to contact the financial institution, find out what happened, They'll get you a police report. You're going to need this because if you are a victim of identity theft, it's going to take a lot to clean up your credit. And things may just keep popping up year and year later. So send letters, send them certified. So when, if you get a mail, a, a call from a bill collector and they say, you didn't pay this, and you say, no, 
I'm a victim of identity theft. I sent a letter to the company. Here's the return receipt. Here's who signed for it. You may actually have to go into that to find that out. They'll reissue cards. They'll give you a written report of the charges that you're claiming are fraudulent. Contact the credit bureaus. They have things called fraud alerts. I work for the government. My identity got stolen. Somebody from China stole a bunch of identities from OPMs. I was one of them. So what did I do? I contacted the credit, the credit bureaus. They put a fraud alert on my credit. My daughter went out and bought a car and needed a co-signer. So I went and co-signed it for it. They came. They asked for my, they needed my driver's license. They asked me information. They said, there's this thing on your credit. And I knew it was on. Why it was on there is because I put on the fraud alert. So they really took that seriously and they really checked out to make sure it was really me that was trying to authorize this credit. So contact your credit bureau. Put a fraud alert on your credit report if this happens to you. Contact the police. File a police report. You're going to need a copy of that police report for a lot of different things. You know, just prove that you are a victim of identity theft. To get, you can get another credit card report, credit bureau report for free if you are a victim of identity theft. You know, they will put certain fraud alerts on your credit. So be careful with this stuff. Be persistent. It doesn't go away overnight. I know people that have their identity stolen, and they still have problems five years later. Be persistent. Don't give up on it. You know, it's not going to go away. Freeze your credit if you feel like you can, you're finally at a point in time where you can do that. Then they can't open any accounts. It's one quick fix. Contact the FTC. They keep track of everything going on. And if they see a pattern somewhere, they're going to contact the local police department. So what to do next? Close accounts that you feel have been compromised. Contact those credit card companies and say, this isn't me, I want to close this account. Remove bogus charges from your account. And the only way you're going to know you have those bogus charges is if you get your credit report and you look at it and you review it. Correct your credit report. It's not an easy task, but it can be done, and that's one of the reasons why you need that police report to show you had your identity stolen. Considering an extended fraud alert or a credit freeze. Like I said, Ohio has them for $5 per credit agency. So it's $15 for you, $15 for your spouse, but they're good indefinitely. If you want to lift it for a couple years to go and buy a house, to go and buy a car, you can lift it for six months, put it back on there. You, they will charge you every time you do any changes to it, but it's still, it's, it's worth it. It's much better than having your identity stolen. So how to get your credit reports? I know I'm done. I know. I got, I got to finish up. We take questions, too. Okay. Well, this is my very last one. Okay. In your creditreports.com, the 1-800 number is in that handout that, that you're going to be picking up when you leave. So you want me to do questions now? Well, I'm going to do questions real quick. Thank you, Pam, by the way. Thank you. Great information.